Tory infighting. We covered yesterday the Lord Corridors and the Conservative Democratics organization call to now deselect the wet Tory MPs. But the reality is, and the truth is, that Tory infighting in and around Brexit has been a constant factor even before, you know, Brexit as a word came into being. Before Brexit, it was Euroscepticism and the continuous ideals of we want to deregulate the UK. A lot of Tories were very disappointed that Margaret Thatcher did not follow through and complete her political economic transformation of the UK because she went and joined like the UK to the single market. Indeed, she is one of the people who birthed sort of the single market and, and has a history in and around the creation of it. And they couldn't understand why she did it. And this caused this split in the Tory party that has been festering, that resulted in Brexit, which is still causing infighting to this day. This is why even now they've got their Brexit, even Tories who agreed on Brexit can't now even agree on what to do that they've achieved Brexit. So this has constantly caused this infighting, and it is all down to this free market fundamentalism of we want low taxes, low, like, small estate. To which you should always say, in response to any Tory who says that, well, okay, what is the state no longer going to do? Because if you are going to lower taxes and reduce the size of the state, then you are implying implicitly that the, the UK government is going to not perform functions or do stuff that it used to do. So what exactly is it that it is no longer going to do? And that is the part where they get very silent. That is the part where they quickly transition to talk about, oh, we just want to cut down on waste. Or we think X department is too big by not telling you, um, you know, what part of that department they would get rid of. Ultimately, it would be the regulatory uh, arm, probably, that functions in that department. Um, and of course, one of the things we said about Brexit is that the UK is going to come very quickly to terms with what how important regulations really were and, you know, why we need them. <laughs> but anyway. Um, going to go cover this because I think this is uh, sort of important because you've had a MP who is stepping down at the next general election, a guy called uh, Paul, uh, what is his name now, Paul, uh, yeah, Paul Scully. And this is a guy who is, he is like pro-Brexit. He is, he is very, a very pro-Brexiteer uh, when it comes to it. But he has said, actually come out that the whole reason that we are in fighting is because of Brexit, because there was no plan, there was no idea. Overall, he's not wrong. He's, he's really, really not wrong. So let's get on into this then, because I think it's more than worth covering uh, something like this. But as always, um, let's crack on uh, into this then. So uh, before we do, uh, like I say, like, share, subscribe if you are new to the channel. And of course, down below, there are links to my Patreon page, the one of the nation called Buy Me Coffee, where you can walk Buy Me Coffee, the YouTube thank you button, and of course, the Pony Club as well down below, which you can use to subscribe to the channel as well. Um, thank you very much to everyone who does help support the channel that way. Even if you do, just click the like and share button. Leave a comment down below. That helps with the old algorithmical voodoo that goes on behind the scenes of YouTube. And of course, as always, thank you very much to all those people who do help and support the channel. So let's go on over into this. So, Brexit caused the Tory infighting that will cost us the election, ex-minister says. So, voters will think the Tories have lost our marbles if they try to replace Rishi Sunak after the next month local elections, says former minister Paul Scully. The 56-year-old Sutton MP agrees that the bad results will cause palpitations, particularly if the Tories lose Andy Street and Ben Houchen, their high-profile mayors, but says deposing Sunak would be mad. So I've said before about this, 
this is why the upcoming local elections get out. Make sure you vote for them. Make sure, especially if you are, again, Ben Houchins, which is the Tees, Tees Valley, and Andy Street is the um, Midlands, West Midlands, I want to say Birmingham area. I think it is his mayoral ship covers. Uh, but again, he was not that too long ago threatening to resign over Sunak ditching HS2. He just did not follow through. I wish he would have, because that would have been, you know, cherry on the cake of, of, of Sunak ditching like HS2. He should have followed through on that, and he was a coward not to follow through on that. Um, but there you go. And of course, we've talked about the opportunities of, of getting rid of Ben Houchen, uh that that would bring. So yeah, don't need to go any more into that. But he is right. It would cause massive palpitations. And of course, the Tories, as we've said many times, do not make good decisions when they are panicking. So he continues. He said, if we start changing leader now, I cannot think what the public would think. They would think that we've lost our mind. Scully has no reason to love the Prime Minister, who sacked him from his ministerial position last November and did little to actually help his subsequent bid to become the Tories' mayoral candidate for London's mayor. Scully served as, London, as the Minister for London from February of 2020 and the Under-Parliamental Secretary for State of Technology and Digital Economy from October of 2022. But having now announced his decision to stand down as an MP last month, Scully has now opted to tell his party a few home truths. So let's find out what these home truths are. Particularly about the dangers of speaking to an ever dis di uh, diminishing audience and infighting. He said that if we are just focusing on the core vote, Eventually, that core shrinks to nothing, he posted on Twitter recently. Talk more about housing. Uh, renting uh, renting first because home ownership has now drifted too far away for so many. Show a real connection and empathy with other generations. Otherwise, we risk punishing ourselves into an ideological cul-de-sac. That's already happened. <laughs> that's, that's, that's already happened, my friend. Yeah, you're too late to arrive to the party on that. And bear in mind, I've said before, uh, I regularly look at Conservative Home just to see what's going on in like the non-parliamentary Conservative Party. And so, so many times there have been calls on that website that we need to do more about housing. We need to do more about housing. We need to do, uh, Have they done anything more about housing? No, they've not done a single thing in 14 years to do anything about housing. And the housing crisis has become even worse. So they're already in that cul-de-sac. <laughs> they're, they're already there. <laughs> but he continued. Uh, he said that the standard devolution model is true in politics. Most people are in the middle. We can work uh, with the bell curve or become the bell ends. <laughs> Again, too late for that. But too late for that, my friend. You, you're already there. <laughs> um, but we need to make that decision, and I fear the electorate already has. So, what should Sunak say to try and convince all those Tory voters that they aren't just lobbying for older homeowners? He said, the first thing really is, uh, I have to say something. I'm being very straightly flippant, but literally at the moment, I am not hearing anything. He says his party shouldn't allow Labour to grab the agenda on planning reform, but drive ahead with radical moves to promote house building. Similarly, he wants to see more done for renters, including improving the pay and job security. Well, again, you've had 14 years to do that. Why haven't, why haven't you done it? You know? <laughs> Sunak acknowledges, uh, sorry, Sully, Scully acknowledges, however, that the latest watering down of legislation to try and improve the rights of leaseholders was a consequence of the short-termism and vested interest. He said that the Conservatives have completely lost their genius for internal coalition building. The foundations got knocked out somewhere, and until we get that back, we are having that loose coalition of realising that politics is the art of possibility, you are never going to get anywhere. I've said this before, he is right. It's not just within the Conservatives that you have to have that coalition and have that 
strong coalition with like good foundations of what it is built on. It's the exact same thing in Labour as well. If you have that good coalition, you can get stuff done. You can find compromise. You can get stuff done very well. And that is what we have to look forward to in the next general, at the next parliament. And even after that. So we will see what happens in, uh, you know, in the next parliament. Ultimately, as I've said before, I don't think we'll get everything I, I want. I, you know, I'm going to disagree with, with stuff that Starmer is says, uh, and he's going to do. I, but I would rather have them in than have this Tory party in that is going to deliver absolutely nothing of what I want. But there you go. Uh, he says, whoever is the next leader, they will uh, have to be leader of what is currently an unleadable party, he says. And this is it. I, I agree with him on that as well. Whoever is the next party leader, this idea that they are going to sort of really turn it into a leadable party is going to be absolutely false because you will have to seriously start cracking heads, start cracking the whip, start, you know, throwing people out of the party and start to really install some discipline. And if you do not do that, if you are a leader and you do not do that in the Conservative Party, forget it. The party is just going to be unleadable. And we saw this um, when May took over. We saw this when Johnson took over. He initially did. You know, he threw out all the MPs he considered not to be on his side. Uh, when Liz Truss took over, she couldn't get any leadership going uh, on her side. She didn't try and, you know, sort of get people on, on side or on board. And even when Sunak has taken over, he has proven to be an absolutely weak prime minister, allowing all this fermentation within his own party to just continue to fester. Uh, they need someone who is actually going to sort of crack the whip. But if you do that, you are still going to have an increasing problem within your party. But you've got to have someone who is actually brave enough to say that and do that within the party. If you cannot do that, then the Conservative Party is done for a considerable amount of time. Which is why I keep on saying, the bigger the defeat, the more they're going to be like that. Um, so, how did it come to this? Scully himself, an ardent Brexiteer, blames the rancour of that debate, saying, what we saw through the Brexit years, when Parliament was in a stasis, was lots of people saying things couldn't be unsaid. The problem is that this becomes easier to do the next time and the next time. Since we've uh, had uh, had the arguments about our approach to lockdown, the economy, and any number of things, you are not looking for ways to get together, but drag the party in their mould. Even when the Tories are addressing the genuine concerns, he says that too often they do so with the language aimed at a very narrow group of people. So if you look at some of the stuff that Suella Braverman and others have said about immigration, the kernel of it is not wrong. I disagree with that, but there you go. Again, his perspective. Uh, the wrapping, on the other hand, alienates big groups of people. A again, like I say, completely agree with him, but again, this is sort of his analysis looking at his own internal party. Yeah, there you go, but yeah. So he continues, the attack ads are as London as a crime-ridden crime, uh, crime -ridden from Susan Hall. The woman who beat Scully to the contest at uh, contest the capital's mayoralty were very ill-judged. It needs a basic sense check. Winning the party's leadership by appealing to its ideological purity will only ensure defeat at a general election, he says. You are going to be condemned, condemned to be a leader of the opposition. The biggest fear I have is that people just stop listening to us and you just end up talking to a smaller subset of the Conservative Party. <laughs> Holy moly, give this man an award. Give this man an award. He gets it. This is what we've been talking about, about the Conservative Party and the direction of like how bad they are going all this time. He gets it. He gets it that there is this ever shrinking minority that they're speaking to because that minority is just happens to be the vocal minority and they're giving them and they're feeding them so much attention. And the thing is, they ignore the rest of the party then to their own detriment. Shockingly, this guy gets it. How does this guy get it? 
and yet none of the other Tories seem to get it. Who knows? Uh, will he be listened to? I very much doubt it. <laughs> Like, no one is going to listen to this guy about the problems he is saying. He will just be ignored. Uh, and to be honest, good. Because the Tory party deserves everything it's got going to it. He is right. They're heading into a complete cul-de-sac. There is no way out of it. Um, not without a, a genuine, strong leader that can lead them out of it. And to do that, they will have to do all the things that every single past, you know, conservative leader going all the way back to David Cameron, has sort of refused to do. Um, but there you go. Uh, <laughs> fun fun, fun times are going to happen in the Conservative Party. And as we've said before, looking forward to it. <laughs> anyway. Uh, Scully believes that he may have been sacked because he had let it be known that he was thinking of standing down as an MP, as, as an MP uh, of the dismissed felt very brutal. He now recounts how uh, he was five minutes into the online meeting with Michael Gove when he saw the Chief Whip's number flash upon his phone. He paused the meeting to take the call, assuming it was just a courtesy call informing him uh, that he was just uh, staying put, but never but never returned. Uh, I got up, hugged my private secretary, and left. The damaging feature of politics, he says, is that party management means quiet con uh, Con con uh, concierge com con com uh, compliments prospers far less than the spunky, awkward troublemaking. But unless the Tories find some team spirit from somewhere, they are doomed, he says. That team spirit ain't happening. Even now, when they are meant to be coming together to at least look like, you know, they are united with the upcoming local elections. That ain't happening. <laughs> you know, we've had the survey from the local councillors of the Conservative Party saying they do not think that the parliamentary party is not right-wing enough. That, to me, signals a wide problem, a very wide problem in the Conservative Party that they are going to be, <laughs> they are going to have to fix. But, as always, we'll see what happens when it happens. So, we talked a lot about what would happen next and who are the next leaders, but that's kind of uh, kind of stuff for another day. He said, "You cannot win. Uh, you can win three four in extra time after you've been three nil three nil down at half time, but only if you are all attacking the same goal. If you're all punching one another on the halfway line, you've got no chance." Can't disagree with him. You can't disagree with him. And yeah, it's it's so funny. Because if you were in a political party and you were having such problems, you'd think you'd pay attention to this guy. You'd think, hold on, should we be listening to the criticisms of what's going on within our, our own party? Making sure that those those points are, are heard and sort of looked at. Uh, I did a Pony Club video very, very recently talking about how um, someone was... Uh, going to take the the internal party Labour Party mechanisms to court, and I was said I'm fine with that. You know, I I want that to be, you know, truthful and accurate to see what's going on behind the party as well. So I'm perfectly fine with that type of criticism. I think that is is perfectly valid. I talked about again if I was in that video, if I was an SNP member, given everything that's been going on, all the stuff we're finding about Operation Branchforth. If I was a member of the SNP, I'd absolutely be wanting that to take place, that to happen. And of course, internal change in the party, which I don't think currently really is happening, um, for that to never happen again. You know, you want your party to be good. You want your party to be to be better. And having and hearing criticism is fair and just and valid. Now, of course, the Tories are not going to listen to this because as we've said, their biggest problem is what he said. They are stuck ideologically looking down the line, thinking this is our core audience. Wow, how big is that core audience? It's not big at all. It's like they've got a, all they've got is this the, the 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 magnifying glass going. Wow, look how look how big our core audience is, guys. Look how big it is. Wow, wow. 
in reality, it's not that big at all. Um, but there you go. <laughs> so, as always, uh, thank you very much for watching. And of course, as always, let me know what you think down below in the comments. Do remember to click the like and share button on your way out. And of course, as always, we'll see you all next time.